What is DDD and why it is important to future proof our code? Let's discover it in the next 9 minutes. A domain is the subject of a software system or application. Let's imagine that we are tasked to build an online store. The domain of our software is everything that is related or necessary to operate the store. We immediately realize that the domain of our online store is much more complex than we initially thought. It may also require expertise from other disciplines like marketing, accounting and law. But how can a software developer deal with such complexity? The answer is, we create a domain model. A model is a simplified and structured abstraction that maps and documents everything of interest in the domain. Its main goals are to distill knowledge, create a ubiquitous language, and a shared understanding among all stakeholders, from software developers to executives. For the domain model to be effective, it has to be binding. It's like a contract. Everyone in the company must use its terminology. If we call something cart, everyone must use that term. Shopping list, trolley, basket, they are not allowed because they would just create confusion and misunderstandings. Most importantly, software developers need to abide by it and implement it as documented. Otherwise, the end result is a system that does not behave as intended. How do we design a model? We divide the design into two phases, tactical design and strategic design. In the tactical phase, we focus on the lower level details. While in the strategic one, we look at the big picture. During the tactical design phase, we use the building blocks of the DD to create a detailed view of our model. We use entities, value objects, associations, and other constructs. Let's start by defining entities. An entity is a class mapping a subject or object with a well-defined identity and life cycle. Entities must have unique identifiers since their equality is not based on their properties. You can have two users with the same first name and last name. Thus, you need to add an identifier to distinguish them. During the life cycle of an entity, its state might change while the thread of identity is continued. Imagine a product whose price fluctuates while its identity is constant. A value object represents an element of the model that has no conceptual identity. Two value objects are equal when their properties are equal. Imagine an address defined by these properties. If you have two instances of this class with the same values, those instances are considered equal. Value objects enrich the model with details. In fact, they are often used with entities to keep them lean. The address could be defined as a property of the user entity. Once the user is deleted, the address is deleted with it as well. And now we talk about associations. Objects in a domain are interconnected by some sort of relationship. That's known as an association. Most relationships in real life are bidirectional. An order contains one or more products, while a product can be part of multiple orders. That's an example of a many-to-many -many relationship. Such relationships are difficult to implement and maintain in code. For this reason, we can optimize our model by imposing a traversal direction. In our scenario, I would favor the direction starting from order. It is the most natural one. When we visualize an order, we want to see the products, while the reverse will be extremely rare. Other options to simplify associations are to leverage one-to-one -one and one-to-many relationships. An account can be restricted to only one card, while the relationship between order and other items is a one-to-many. At times it might be difficult to represent a concept as an entity or a value object. This is particularly true when we want to map an operation rather than someone or something. In this case we use services. A service is a stateless operation whose interface is defined by other elements of the model. The service stands alone in the model and has no associations. We could create a service that accepts an order and payment method, performs the actual payment and returns the transaction details. Services are very common in frameworks. Unfortunately, they are also abused. 
It is not uncommon to see anemic models. In these models, all of the logic is stored in services, while entities are simply sterile bags of data with no behavior. This is against the core idea of DDD. Entities should encapsulate behavior. For instance, an entity is responsible to protect its state from being corrupted. It should not rely on an external class to do that. And now we talk about aggregates and factories. When the models start growing large, we use aggregates to group a set of closely related entities. We establish a boundary and a root, which we use to control all access to the objects inside. This way we can simplify our model by allowing references only to aggregate roots, and we can guarantee sanity of the entire aggregate as a whole. To build and interact with complex objects like aggregates, we can use factories. Factories could be methods. For example, we could expose a method on orders to create new line items. Factories can also be standalone classes which generate aggregates or entities. For example, we could have an order factory generating sequentially numbered orders. And finally, we have repositories that are used to retrieve particular instances of our entities. Their main goal is to avoid crowding the entity with querying and persistent concerns, which should bloat it. We can create an order repository where we can fetch order by IDs, account or date range. And that's all for the tactical design. Now we focus on strategic design. As you may have noticed, a common concern is that one to reduce complexity. The answer is always to introduce some form of boundary that allows us to focus on a particular aspect of our model and reduce the complexity of all the possible associations with other objects. The larger the project we're working on, the higher are the chances that creating a unified model is not feasible. We might need multiple teams to work concurrently to deliver the entire model. In the strategic design phase, we decompose our model into distinct sub-models by creating bounded contexts. Within the bounded context, we are able to continuously build, test and optimize the model independently from other contexts. We also specialize its function and create a more precise dialect that is used by the team members and experts involved in it. If you are wondering if there is any relation to microservices, you are spot on. Strategic DDD is often used to define the competencies of a microservice. I will talk more about that in another video. Associations obviously exist also between bounded contexts, and they can become complex very quickly. To address this issue, we can create a context map, where we document the points of contact between the different models. An effective context map defines clear names and boundaries for each context that they are shared by all teams. The relationships between models and teams are even more complex than those we saw in tactical design. This is because they not only affect data and features, but most importantly they affect the way different software development teams integrate with each other. There are several ways to govern these relationships. You could have a team acting as a customer to another team, that's known as the customer-supplier relationship. Another approach could be to have two or more teams share a portion of their models where they collaborate, that's the share kernel. Another common approach, especially when dealing with models outside our control, is to create an anti-corruption layer, which allows us to keep our model focused on its subject and use this layer to perform the translation to another model. As you can imagine, strategic DDD can become really complex and we just touch the surface. A lot of the information I share is based on the domain-driven design book by Eric Evans, and I'm leaving you the link in the description. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe, and see you next time.